you are somewhat familiar with DOS, you probably have heard of the 640k memory limitation of DOS. But have you wondered why so many DOS games actually require your PC to have more than 1 megabytes of memory installed? Some games even went as far to require 8 megabytes of RAM. In this video, we will try to answer this question by looking at a crucial period of the PC history, and a technological marvel that permanently changed the video game industry. In 1981, IBM released the first PC, paired with the 16-bit Intel 8088 processor. It's a cut-on version of the 8086 processor, released a couple of years earlier. It will be four years later, in 1985, that Intel released the 8386 processor, the first 32-bit x86 processor. So from the PC hardware's point of view, the 16-bit era only lasted five years. The software side, however, would take many more years to fully transition to 32-bit, despite the CPU's capability of running 32-bit code with the release of 386. This is especially the case before the 90s, when 16-bit applications and games were predominant. As a 16-bit processor, the 8088 mainly works with 16-bit integers. The maximum amount of memory that can be addressed using a 16-bit integer is 64 kilobytes. The 16-bit x86 architecture, however, uses a trick to address up to 1 megabyte of memory. By combining the values of two 16-bit integers, one of which is a special register called the segment register, its value is left shifted by 4 bits, then added to the value of a general purpose register. This adds up to 20 bits to represent a memory address, hence the 1 megabyte memory addressing capability. The original PC supports a few operating systems, but it was PC-DOS, later MS-DOS, who became the de facto operating system for the PC until the release of Windows 3.0 and later Windows 95. To allow the 16-bit MS-DOS operating system to run, due to obvious compatibility reasons, the 386 architecture has two operation modes, with the default one acting as an 8088 processor. This mode is called real mode while the other one is called protected mode, allowing the processor to access more than 1 megabytes of RAM. So it seems that by running the 3D6 processor in real mode, MS-DOS and its applications can't fully utilize the full potential of the processor and larger RAM. That statement, however, is only partially true. The DOS applications have only 640K of memory to work with, which is called conventional memory. Regardless of how much memory is installed in your system, uh, they're only limited to work with that. And um, you have, uh, usually people have too many things running within that conventional memory, device drivers, memory resident utilities uh, that take up that space. As software became more and more complicated, the one megabyte memory access limitation imposed by the 16-bit x86 architecture started plaguing the software industry, resulting into the publish of EMS, or Expanded Memory Specification, in 1985, and XMS, or Extended Memory Specification, in 1988, both of which allowed the application code to remain 16-bit while utilizing additional memory. However, these two techniques are slow, especially for applications demanding high performance, for example games. This is because EMS uses bank switching technique, while XMS incurs memory copy when a different region of memory beyond the 1 megabyte range is accessed. So how did DOS games cope with the memory situation? In fact, most of the big DOS game titles from the early 90s are not even 16-bit applications. There are 32-bit applications running on top of DOS. To prove this, let's take a look at some games. Using DOSBox debugging capability, we can pause the game and inspect the CPU state to confirm if the CPU is running in 16-bit real mode, 16-bit protected mode, or 32-bit protected mode. But before that, let's familiarize ourselves with the i386 architecture so we know what we should be looking for. An i386 CPU has 8 general purpose registers, a program counter, and 6 segment registers. The segment registers are 16-bit, while other registers are 32-bit. When operating in real mode, all the registers are 16-bit, and the segment register FS and GS are inaccessible. By using different names, we can access different portions of a given register. For example, we can use AL to access the lowest 8 bits of the EAX register, 
AH to access bit 8 through 15, AX to access the lower 16 bits, and EAX for the entire register. When operating in real mode, the segment registers contain upper 16 bits of segment addresses which participate in the aforementioned memory address calculation. In protected mode, these segment registers contain indexes into global descriptor table or local descriptor table. The actual address of the segment is stored in the corresponding table entry. With the basic knowledge of the f 3 d 6 architecture, we can start looking at some games. The first game we will be looking at is Biomanus. It is a side-scrolling platform game released by Apogee Software in August 1993. After getting into the gameplay, let's go to the debugger of DOSBox. We can see that all the general purpose registers have the upper 16 bits set to 0, and DOSBox confirmed the CPU is currently running in real mode. Let's take a look at the next one, Doom, which was released in the same year. The debugger shows that the general purpose registers have non-zero content in the upper 16-bit portion. DOSBox also confirms the CPU is running in 32-bit protected mode. So Doom is actually a 32-bit game. Using the same method, we can confirm that all the games we saw at the beginning of the video with the memory requirements larger than 1 MB are 32-bit applications. So how is this possible? How do 32-bit games run on a 16-bit MS-DOS? The answer is DOS extenders. The idea of DOS extenders is actually quite simple. A modern 32-bit or 64-bit operating system supporting preemptive multitasking would interrupt the current application thread from time to time to check if it should give the CPU to another thread or if it needs to do some profiling work. This is the case for every Windows release starting from Windows 95. On the contrary, MS-DOS is a rather passive operating system, which normally doesn't interrupt the foreground application during its execution. And because MS-DOS applications have total control of the hardware, they can switch the CPU to protected mode and stay in that mode for the majority of the time, and only switch the CPU back to real mode if DOS comes into the picture. This is the fundamental idea behind DOS extenders. The use of real mode is minimized with DOS extenders, but it cannot be completely eliminated. Mode switching isn't free of performance penalty, but fortunately games don't involve a lot of DOS system calls. In 1989, when Microsoft was working on Windows 3.0, some DOS extenders were already being developed and used. To fully utilize the potential of the 3D6 processor, Windows 3.0 aims to operate in protected mode, providing larger memory access and multitasking capabilities. This overlaps with the goal of DOS extenders, so it only makes sense to standardize the DOS extender scene to allow applications using DOS extenders to also run under the protected mode environment of Windows 3.0. To achieve this goal, the DPMI specification, or DOS protected mode interface was created. Skimming through the DPMI spec, we can see some functionalities similar to those that would be provided by a modern operating system kernel. In fact, an implementation of DPMI acts like another operating system kernel running alongside the DOS kernel to provide crucial protected mode operating system services, most notably virtual memory management. And Windows 3.0 is one of the DPMI implementations itself. Almost all of the DOS extenders released after the publish of DPMI are based on it. The invention of DOS extenders had a great impact on the gaming industry, as it allows 32-bit memory access with almost no performance penalty. The confirmation to DPMI also means the game will run on Windows as well. The most famous and widely used DOS extender is DOS4GW, bundled with the Wacom CC++ compiler. Games using the extender will print a message indicating the existence of DOS4GW during launch. Curiously, while all the DOS-based Doom games use DOS4GW, when each software worked on Quick, they moved to a customized version of the CWS DPMI extender bundled with the DJGPP open source compiler, which is a DOS port of the GCC compiler. DOS extenders are often bundled with compiler suites. This is because in order to generate a 32-bit DOS application, 
the compiler must know what needs to be invoked to set up the 32-bit environment. And the implementation of the standard C library is also closely related to the low-level DOS extender and DPMI APIs. The adoption of DOS extender, thanks to the DPMI specification, is pretty much transparent to users. But how about the developers? What needs to be done to adopt DOS extender from a developer's point of view? In fact, it's pretty simple. A developer only needs to know how to use the correct DOS external functions when it comes to places where a mode switching is necessary, especially when registering interrupt handlers and driver callbacks. To better demonstrate this, let's take a look at the code of a simple application which prints out mouse events when the mouse is moved or the buttons are clicked. The application uses the mouse services provided using Software Interrupt 33H. It registers a callback function to receive mouse events, which will be printed out from the main application loop. The application was first written for the DJGPP compiler using the CWS DPMI DOS extender. It was then tweaked so that it can be compiled by the Turbo C++ compiler, which generates real-mode applications. And I'll have the two source files open side by side. The one on the left side is for DJGPP, and the other one is for Turbo C. At the beginning of the file, we can see that the DJGPP version has more header files, providing DPMI and DOS extender APIs. On the Turbo C set, the UN16 type must be defined, as Turbo C predates the standardization of the STV in the header file. Moving down, we can see more static variables on the DJGPP side, therefore supporting the creation of a real mode wrapper for the DOS callback. The Turbo C set doesn't need any of those, since the app will stay in real mode. So here comes the first interesting function, which is the mouse event handler. The first few lines of the DJGPP side can be confusing if you don't know what they are trying to achieve, because this function will be invoked as a driver callback in real mode. Page fault cannot be handled, hence the entire function code must be wired down to physical memory beforehand. The first few lines of the function checks the size of the function so that we know how many bytes to wire down. The Turbo C set also has its quirks. There are five lines to retrieve register values. The code only works with Turbo C because it's not standard. And it's a bit dangerous here because nothing stops the compiler from adding more code before these lines, which can mess up the register values. Moving on to the function where the mouse event handler is installed. The DJGPP version has quite some extra code, serving two purposes. The first purpose is to allocate the real mode wrapper for the mouse event handler. The wrapper will get all the register values at the moment it is invoked, switch to protected mode and code the actual handler with the copied register values passed as parameters. This is why for the previous function, the DJGPP version doesn't have to get the register values in the way that the Turbo C version does. The second purpose of the extra code is to wire down code and data that will be used by the handler. As I mentioned before, virtual memory management will not be available when the handler is invoked. The next function looks very similar on the two sides. The only differences are, first, the API functions to generate a software interrupt are different. The other difference is that the DJGPP version must free up the real mode wrapper allocated in the previous function. And finally, the main function, which is identical on both sides. So overall, the conversion is straightforward. And for most applications, the majority of the code will focus on logic or calculation, which is not system-specific. So tweaks specific to DOS extenders are generally not needed. I always find DOS extenders to be fascinating. The core idea is simple yet elegant for a rather chaotic era of the PC history. It extended the lifespan of MS-DOS way beyond what people thought was possible. And its legacy is engraved into the memory of an entire generation via the form of so many classic DOS games, many of which defined a new video game genre and shaped the video game industry as we know it today. This concludes this video on 32-bit DOS applications. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked the video, click the like button and subscribe to the channel for future videos. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions. 
I will also leave the link to the official site of the DJGPP compiler in the video description in case you want to learn more and make a 32-bit DOS application yourself. I will see you in the next video.